Hello again and welcome to All About Intervals. In this video we'll talk about the basic EKG measurements of the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT interval. Specifically we'll talk about what do they mean, how do we measure them, and how do they help us. So let's go ahead and get started. Now this is the method of EKG interpretation we went over during the last video. However, you're free to use any method you'd like, but I'm showing you this algorithm mostly to ground you in the general framework we'll go through with some of these first few videos. So as you can see, we've done rate and rhythm, and so now we're going to talk about intervals. So these are our basic EKG measurements. You can see here we've got the PR interval, the QRS duration, and the QT interval. The PR interval represents the time from the beginning of atrial depolarization to the beginning of ventricular depolarization. It's measured from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex. Note that it's not necessarily measured to the R wave, but rather to the beginning of the QRS complex. So if the QRS starts with a Q wave, you just measure it to there. So you might ask, why don't we call this the PQ interval? And that's a good question. A normal PR interval is between 0.12 seconds to 0.20 seconds in duration. In other words, it's between three small boxes in width to five small boxes in width. A PR interval that's greater than 0.2 seconds is called prolonged. Most commonly, this is due to increased AV conduction delay, such as what is seen in a first degree AV block. We'll talk more about AV blocks later but a first degree AV block represents a consistently prolonged PR interval. When the PR interval is short, it indicates that for whatever reason it takes less time for the impulse to make it from the atria to the ventricles. Most commonly you can see this in patients who have an accessory pathway, such as what is seen in the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. We'll talk more about WPW or the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome later. The QRS duration represents the amount of time it takes for the ventricles to fully depolarize. It's measured from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the QRS complex. A normal QRS duration is typically less than 0.1 seconds or 2.5 small boxes. When it's greater than 0.12 seconds or 3 small boxes, we call it wide. In a bundle branch block, one of the bundle branches of the Hisperkinji system is dysfunctional, typically due to structural heart disease. As a result, it takes longer for the impulse to make it through the complete ventricular myocardium and we end up with a QRS complex that's wide. This intermediate zone of 0.1 seconds to 0.12 seconds, which is a little bit wide, I like to use the general term of an intraventricular conduction delay to describe this kind of a QRS duration. You may hear a lot of people use the cutoff of 0.12 seconds as the threshold between normal and abnormal for a QRS duration. However, I'll say that as a general rule of thumb, the wider that a patient's QRS complex is, the more likely it is that they have structural heart pathology. And for that reason, when I encounter a QRS duration that's even just in that intermediate zone, I take it seriously. Okay, now let's talk about the QT interval. The QT interval represents the time from the start of ventricular depolarization to the end of ventricular repolarization. It's measured from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Now, notice that the QRS complex, which represents depolarization, makes up only a fraction of the QT interval. The rest of this time is spent mostly in repolarization. Thus, the QT interval, more than anything, reflects ventricular repolarization, and processes that affect repolarization tend to have the greatest effect on the QT interval. It's important to know that at fast heart rates, the QT interval tends to be shorter, thus permitting a shorter refractory delay before the ventricles can fire again. Similarly, at slow heart rates, the QT interval tends to be longer. Thus, we use something that is known as a corrected QT interval, or a QTC, to better characterize whether a patient's QT interval is normal. The QTC is derived from Bazet's formula, which is defined as the QT interval in seconds divided by the square root of the R to R interval in seconds, where the R to R interval represents the amount of time between two consecutive QRS complexes. A normal QTC is less than 0.44 seconds. However, you might have noticed that it seems like a lot of patients' QTCs tend to be longer than that. And so for that reason, I'll tell you that a QTC that's longer than 0.46 seconds is pretty much universally accepted as being long. And a QTC that's greater than 0.48 seconds in a woman or greater than 0.47 seconds in a man is very long. A quick eyeball method of figuring out whether a patient's QT interval is normal 
is to see if the QT interval is less than half the distance between two consecutive QRS complexes. In other words, is the QT less than half of the R to R? Okay, as we mentioned before, things that affect ventricular repolarization tend to have the greatest effect on the QT interval. Thus, there are a number of important causes of QT prolongation you should know. Important causes of QT prolongation include electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypokalemia, though you can also see it with low magnesium and low calcium. Also, a number of medications can cause QT prolongation, including antipsychotics, antiarrhythmics, and some antibiotics, for example, macrolides and fluoroquinolones. Hypothermia can also cause QT prolongation because of its impact on ventricular repolarization, and a number of other acute processes can cause QT prolongation, including acute myocardial infarction or ischemia. Additionally, some patients can have a congenital long QT syndrome. It's important to know that this list isn't all inclusive. You'll notice that a lot of patients tend to have long QT intervals, but this is just to give you an idea of important causes. Now, why is it a big deal if a patient has a long QT interval? Well, having a long QT interval increases a patient's risk of developing torsade de pointe, uh, which is a form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. It's a potentially fatal arrhythmia. So for that reason, let's say I have a patient who has a QT interval that's long, let's say 0.48 seconds. I might use a different antibiotic to treat her respiratory infection. I might not use a fluoroquinolone or a macrolide. Now let's go ahead and look at the intervals on a couple of EKGs. So looking at this EKG, let's start with a PR interval. It looks like I can see the PR interval pretty well in the rhythm strip, which is lead two at the bottom. And so let's take a closer look down there. Remember that we measure the PR interval from the start of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And so you can see it over here. And it looks to be pretty normal. You can see it's less than five small boxes. And the QRS duration is measured from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the QRS complex, as you can see here. And it's supposed to be less than two and a half small boxes or 100 milliseconds. And you can see this one is also pretty normal. For the QT interval, you'll notice that we can't see it that well in this lead. And so let's take a look at another lead to get a better look. We like to pick the lead where it's most easy to find and where it tends to be the longest. And so looking at these leads, I'd say it looks longest in the precordial leads. So let's take a closer look at lead V3. Here you can see after the QRS complex, you have the ST segment followed by an inverted T wave. It's upside down. There are a number of causes of the T wave inversions, which we'll talk about later, but chief among them are ischemia, electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia, and other acute processes. You can see this QT interval is more than half the distance between two QRS complexes, or more than half of the R to R, and so we can say that this is long. Remember that a number of things can cause QT prolongation. In this case, this patient had an acute saddle pulmonary embolism that likely contributed to the QT prolongation and some of these T-wave abnormalities that we can see here. Let's go ahead and look at another one. On this EKG, we can see the waveforms pretty well in a number of leads. So let's just take a closer look at lead B1. So the PR interval we measure from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. You can see here it's less than five small boxes, so it's normal. You'll notice, however, that the QRS duration is wide. It's wider than three small boxes. So in this case, this is a bundle branch block. This EKG is an example of a patient with a left bundle branch block. However, we'll talk in more detail about bundle branch blocks later. But this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And the QT interval looks normal. It's less than half of the R to R, or less than half the distance between two QRS complexes. So the major interval abnormality here is the wide QRS, which represents a bundle branch block. Okay, that's all I've got for intervals. Be sure to tune in next time when we talk about the QRS axis, the QRS transition, and R-wave progression.